I worked for the Audubon Society of New York doing grassland bird nesting surveys. So I actually did get paid to bird for one, one summer. Um, so, but now I continue to do this um, for fun and on my, on my spare time. So when did I become interested in birding or when did you become interested in birding? For me, it was uh, when I was a, a young lad. Um, I grew up within the city of, well, I lived in the city of Rochester until I was about 10 years old. And, you know, I know there were birds around, there were sparrows and rock doves and, and you know, there were, went to the park all the time. So I know they were there, but it really did not trigger for me until I got to, I went to my uh, grandparents' farm in Michigan in Port Huron. And they had a little 10 acre parcel hobby farm and big open fields. And I'll never forget watching the American goldfinch flying around feeding in the fields. And then, you know, I'm watching them out the back window with my grandparents and all, and all of a sudden my grandma or grandpa gave me a, a pair of binoculars and I was able to zoom in and see that beautiful bright yellow bird flying around. It was just kind of like a, whoa moment. So hopefully you have had those or we'll have one shortly. And I hope this talk kind of pushes you to that. So with birding, there's really only two very important things that you need, two basic pieces of equipment, and that's binoculars and a field guide. Um, both, um, you know, they, they are very important tools that help you. The binoculars, of course, you know, so you can zoom in and see the birds. And then the field guide, because that's going to help you identify things. So I prefer a seven to eight power binocular because they are, you know, tend to be lighter and have a bigger field of view versus say a 10 power. Um, you know, they can, that's probably gonna be your most priciest purchase um, if you get into this, but you can find a decent pair from $75 to $200. And I have yet to find uh, like a used, uh, you know, a site where you can sell or, or uh, buy used binoculars, but I think that's a great idea if anyone wants to create that. Um, but I've had the same pair of binoculars for 18 years now, I think, almost 20. Uh, there's these really solid seven power Nikons. I think they're called the Trailblazer. Um, I'm probably due for an upgrade, but they, they work great for me. They're, they're, they're tough. Um, they've been all over the place. They've been up mountains. They've been out in the snow. They've been rained on. They've been bouncing around in my car for years uh, and they still work very well. You know, I just keep, make sure I keep the lenses clear and uh, there's a special brush that does that, but they just work extremely well for me, for what I like, but you may have different preferences. Um, so, you know, I recommend going to a sporting goods store or even like a Wild Birds Unlimited to, to get a pair of binoculars and hold them up and see how they feel and uh, wear them around your neck, and see how, you know, what, what's comfortable for you. So um, the next most important thing, in my opinion, is a really good field guide. Um, there is a number of popular choices. And again, everyone has different preferences, but like Sibley's, Peterson, Coffins, these are all, you know, well-known uh, bird field guides. And uh, my, I am partial to the Sibley field guide and this is, this is the, there is a new version of this one now, the um, Sibley's Field Guide. It's Birds of Eastern North America. So it focuses on birds east of the Rockies. Um, and again, I've had this for almost 20 years. I stick it in my back pocket or my coat pocket, and it, it goes out there in the field with me. Um, it's pretty sturdy. I mean, again, I've been in the rain, snow, up mountains in the backpack, and, um, you know, it's still holding up pretty good. Um, why I like this one so much is that David Allen Sibley is an incredible illustrator and the detail that he captures in his illustrations are really very, very helpful in, in when it comes to identifying birds. Um, another thing I really like and why I prefer is, is because, you know, because of the drawings for sure, but I, I'm not a big fan of, of um, field guides that have pictures of the birds because that picture is of that bird on that particular day in that yard or in that forest. Whereas the illustrations are very detailed and, you know, definitely highlight the birds that, you know, the identifying features, which I'll go over in a little more detail. 
Um, and then there's also the bigger Sibley guide. Um, so you can see the two different sizes. This is the one that lives next to the table where I drink coffee every morning and have a, have a view of my bird feeders. This is a really great book too. Um, this is uh, all birds of North America. Um, so this has got Eastern and Western species. So that, hence the much bigger size. Um, but the Eastern guide is, is perfect for birding around here. Um, again, his detail, the David Allen Sibley, um, there's, it shows birds in flight. Um, and there's just so many things that he captures. And another thing I really like are the range maps in here. Um, I'll go into those in a little more detail at a different slide, but, um, you know, his illustrations really make this book and, you know, compared to other, say the Petersons, Petersons does a great job of grouping similar birds together and highlighting their differences right on the same page. Whereas Sibley, you know, because of the number of illustra illustrations, they tend to spread out further. But, this, you know, the birds are still grouped together and, and should hopefully help you find them. But um, I just, yeah, I'm really partial to this. Mostly probably because this was required uh, book for when I was going to school and took an ornithology course. So, um, but it's been my go-to guide ever since. Um, some questions, you know, a question you may have is where can you go birding in this area? And my number one piece of advice is just go where they are. <laughs> um, your yard is probably a great, a great place to bird and practice and start and learn the basics of it. Um, I've got multiple bird feeders to track birds and um, I've got such a great variety of yard birds and different seasons like because, you know, we're in an area uh, where we get um, birds that breed in the tundra, they overwinter in our region. So, you know, like like uh, snow buntings and and horned larks and shrikes, they'll come down here and, and red poles. And you can uh, get birds like the red poles, you can attract them to your feeders uh, in the winter because they're always looking for, uh, you know, some a good food source. Um, and of course, you know, they're just beautiful creatures and, and, and fun to watch. And especially, you know, you got a male cardinal here in the middle, just a stunning bird that frequents our feeders all the time and, and lives in the yard year round. And then, you know, if you are lucky or, you know, maybe not you feel that way, but you might attract a Cooper's hawk too. Um, they tend to feed on birds around feeders, but um, I've had one of these pop up at our feeder one day. Um, you know, a couple of years ago. So um, you may get something unexpected too. Uh, in the Finger Lakes, we have many, many natural areas and parks. Uh, we have some great state parks. Um, hey, Jason. Hey, Jason. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Are, have you started using the slides yet? Yes. Okay. Because it, it's people aren't able to see them. Are you cycling through them? Uh, yes. Okay. Maybe yeah. I start from like number two. There we go. You can see it now. Um, yeah, would everyone just mind typing in the chat window if they can see the slides? Okay. You can see it? Yep, I think it's working now. Okay, because I didn't hit anything. Sorry about that. Um, can you still see it? I think so. You might want to just maximize the window so it's a little bigger. Uh, yeah, everything's maximized. Okay. Hmm. okay. All right, I'll continue. Um, can you see this one, the bird feeder one? I'm just on the becoming interested in birding picture. <laughs> hmm. I can I'm see. sorry about this. Sure. Now, this now you're strange. clicking on it. There you go. All right, I'm gonna leave it like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is just my um, slideshow setup. So, um, so you can see the basic equipment. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I talked about that. Um, I'll, I'll move on from that. Um, but again, I can answer questions. Uh, later. Um, so back to where can you go birding? 
um, your yard and, uh, you know, is a great spot. Uh, you know, most places have flowering trees and flowers and that attracts birds and bird feeders. Uh, the natural areas in the Finger Lakes, um, you know, there's many, many places to go throughout the area. Um, one of my favorite places to go uh, birding is the Black Diamond Rail Trail. And there's more and more rail trails popping up uh, throughout this area or in the area where you live. Uh, I like them because they are easy to walk. They're nice and level and, and wide open and they tend to have some good edge habitats and you can get some good looks at a lot of different types of birds and they're very accessible, uh, especially if you're with someone, um, you know, that might have some mobility issues or a child in a stroller, uh, they're, they're a great place to go. And of course we have the Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge at the north end of Cayuga Lake. Um, it's a fantastic uh, refuge that is managed for birds and, and migrating birds and bird species. Um, you can see all sorts of waterfowl there during migration. So giant flocks of geese and ducks. Uh, and then they also manage certain areas for shorebirds and, and they create mud flats and have these different shorebirds that like that as they stop and feed on their way to their breeding grounds. And of course, last year was a really great year to see um, sandhill cranes um, at one of the different complexes. Um, so, and there's a great wildlife drive uh, that you can, in different areas you can go to. So that's another great spot. Um, speaking of the Finger Lakes Land Trust, two of my favorite preserves to go birding at around the Ithaca area are the Lindsay Parsons Biodiversity Preserve and the Roy H. Park Preserve. Uh, both are nice big chunks of land that are set aside with trails on it and they have a good mix of habitat. Uh, the Lindsay Parsons Preserve, a biodiversity preserve, is called that for a reason. There's a nice mix of meadows, grasslands, small ponds. There's a really cool beaver pond and wetlands. And, and then there's some old growth forest, or I'm sorry, there's just a mature forest on the property on very steep hillsides that house some pretty cool nesting birds like a worm-eating warbler. And then the Roy H. Park Preserve has Six Mile Creek running through it, so there's some good opportunity to find water thrushes and, and other uh, cool warblers. Um, the Land Trust uh, manages a website called gofingerlakes.org. If you go to that, um, there's a drop-down list of certain activities that um, you may be interested in. It includes skiing, running, uh, cross-country skiing, running, uh, just hiking or kayaking, and then there's a, a drop-down option for birding too. So if you go to that website and you click on that filter, it'll highlight a bunch of places in the whole Finger Lakes region where that's good for birding. And it's just, you know, it's not just the nature preserves that we uh, own and manage. Also, uh, check your local bird listserv uh, through the American Birding Association. Uh, we are very lucky in, in and around the Cayuga Lake Basin. We have a very active birding community, uh, community um, you know, because of, mostly because of the lab of ornithology, I'm sure. Um, and it is a great, great resource to see what birds are showing up. Where can I go to see, um, you know, uh, uh, snow buntings or, and it's, you know, it focuses on the Cayuga Lake Basin, but it's a pretty big area to go birding in and um, it's always, it's a great place to go and just, you know, you get, you can set up and get daily emails and get the updates daily. And I, I click on it all the time. And then if you're up near, you know, more towards Rochester, uh, you have the Genesee um, uh, bird group over that way. And they have the same kind of, um, you know, uh, setup where you can get these daily updates. Oops. So how to identify birds? Um, it takes practice. Uh, it definitely takes practice. I've taken a, a ornithology course. I actually was also a, a, a lab assistant for one uh, before I graduated. And I just learned so much from that. And you know, I know it's not easy to take uh, ornithology courses in college right now, or, but there are some really great birding groups and, um, and communities that host, you know, birding hikes and stuff. And I'll talk more about those. But for me, the basics um, of helping 
helping you to identify birds are the, the five things listed here. So their size uh, is pretty important. Uh, there's markings and habitat and range and sound. And, uh, and the combination of these things could, should help you start to identify birds that you're seeing in and around your yard or as you're out hiking. So the first thing I, I one of the first things is good to the learn, you know, learn the size of the birds, compare them. And I like to use familiar common species and common species to help narrow, you know, narrow down which bird you're seeing. So um, for me, I, I like to use sparrows or the house sparrow. Uh, the, all three of these birds are very common in our area and can be found almost anywhere. Um, so they're also good, you know, birds to use as a point of reference. So the house sparrow, you know, it's kind of on the smaller end. It's not the smallest bird. There's definitely birds smaller, including other sparrows. Of course, we have hummingbirds, um, but that's kind of a good marker uh, for the small end of things. And in the middle, we have the American robin here. Um, they're uh, pretty ubiquitous. You can see them everywhere in our region in the yards and fields, um, in the woods, all over the place. So they're pretty easy to identify with that bright red um, chest and it actually might be nesting over your door right now. So they're hard to miss sometimes. And then when you start getting towards the bigger end of things is like the, this is the American crow. Uh, there's definitely birds bigger than the crow. Um, the raven's bigger than the crow and there's many um, hawks and, and eagles of course are bigger, but this is kind of a good, good common bird um, that will help you uh, identify different sizes and stuff. So once you start narrowing it down through size, there's each bird has some very distinct markings and this is how they identify them and then become a, a distinct species from other birds. Um, so one of the things I'd like to, you know, I'll point out some of the differences in these photos and um, I'll talk about those things. But, you know, when you see a bird, look at it. Um, don't go right for the field guide. Uh, you can either make some mental notes or have a little notebook to jot down things you're seeing and like certain certain markings like that I'm, uh, that I'll talk about here. Um, you know, when you're looking at the bird, practicing the details, um, and this is where your field guide is handy. Like just look at how they forage or their shape. You know, they all have distinct shapes and sizes, and it's good to kind of notice these things and then use those to help you identify the bird that you're seeing. So some of the common markings that I like to use in there, and um, you know, there's, they're true for not all species, but lots of species. And especially when you're trying to differentiate two very similar species. So one of the first things is the eye ring. So if you see this bird in the upper left-hand corner, that's a wood thrush. And um, it has a very distinct bright white eye ring around, right around its eye. Um, it's very noticeable, especially with binoculars. And then, um, and it's, there are other birds that have that white eye ring, but this helps you to identify it, say, from a viri, which is this bird down below it here. Uh, these are both thrushes. Uh, they're related to robins, but they, these are more woodland species birds. They both, uh, you know, habit, habitate in the same spot. Uh, same places in the woods. Um, they are very kind of similar, difference in size and markings, as you can see, uh, but they both have very beautiful flute-like songs that you can probably hear right now um, out in the woods. Um, but like if you look at this berry here, it, it has a pretty weak eye ring, so you can't see it as much as you can this bright eye ring on the wood thrush. And so that is a good way to differentiate the, the two different species in this particular case. You also wanna look for patterns on the tail and chest. So again, we have the, the wood thrush has these very distinct dark spots on, on its chest, whereas the viri has these kind of weak reddish spots. And so that is a, another great way to, to tell the difference between the two species of birds here. Um, Birds uh, also have distinct tail markings. Um, some are way more distinct than others, um, especially that's a great way to tell the difference between some of the hawks and, and, and bigger uh, 
um, birds of prey. But the, the example I chose here are two fly catchers that are, um, you know, can be found in this area pretty regularly. On the top here, we have the kingbird, which is bigger than this bird for sure. Uh, this is the Eastern kingbird. Um, in my opinion, has the coolest Latin name, Tyrannus Tyrannus. Um, <laughs> and um, they are, uh, I'm, I'm hearing them in my yard right now. They are very, very uh, gutsy birds. They'll chase hawks off, but and they are in the same family as the Eastern Phoebe down here below it. Um, Phoebes also tend to nest around our homes um, and they're the same family. They're kind of, you know, they look similar. They're darkish. I mean, of course the Kingbird has a lot more white on it on this particular shot, but the, what I wanted to highlight was the tip of the tail here that has the bright white tip of its tail, whereas the Phoebe doesn't. There's better examples out there, but this is one that, uh, is good for birds of the same family, um, you know, markings that'll help you distinguish in the field. And this, when it flies, when the kingbird flies, it really, you'll see that white end of its tail. Uh, and they also make a ruckus too, but they, uh, they're pretty, they're, they're fun to watch. Um, wing bars are another uh, thing to pay attention to, especially in, in families like the sparrows and warblers even. Uh, in the middle here, this is a blue-winged warbler, um, and you can see they're very distinct white wing bars on, on its wings there. Um, there's a lot of different birds that have different, you know, different wing bars and coloration, but that's one thing that could help you determine once it being one species over another. And also, um, a number of the birds that fly through here um, have breeding plumages and non-breeding plumages. So right now, all the birds are in their, most of the, the songbirds are in their breeding plumage right now because it is nesting season and they're, and they're singing loud and clear. And um, so that's another reason why this guide is great because there's um, non-breeding plumage illustrations too, which really are helpful. And I've been able to identify certain warblers as they're migrating south um, in the fall and their non-breeding plumage. So um, it's good to, to, to compare the two as well. And But again, not all birds have a breeding plumage. Another um, thing that's really important in helping to identify uh, birds is what type of habitat are you finding them in? So uh, I've got some examples here. Um, some that are, um, you know, much more distinct than others, but I'm going to start in the upper corner here. This is a, a bobolink. Uh, if you've never heard of bobolink, and uh, you should try to find them soon. They're such cool birds, very handsome, and they have a, they're like R2-D2 with wings. They make the, this bubbly robotic noise. It's very, very fun to listen to, but they have a very, distinct breeding habitat requirement and they like big open fields like grasslands hay fields meadows and they're um, they're here now uh, you can go to see them in fact this photo um, that was given to us by uh, one of our the photographer many photographers who have donated or uh, given us photos to use uh, this is from Summerlin Farm Preserve which is in the town of Caroline is one of our newest nature preserves and there's a very big, large open uh, hay field there that we will manage in order to, to provide breeding habitat for these birds. But they have a very distinct habitat requirement. You can see them in the woods or on the edge of the woods, but they want that big open field. On the bottom here, we have a spotted sandpiper. They're one of the uh, different shorebirds that move through and, and some of them may even nest in the area. Um, but this is, um, they, they really like to probe the mud with their, their, with their long beak and tongue and they're trying to pick out bugs and they like to go into the, you know, water up to their knees or whatever. Uh, there is a whole thing. We can get lost in a rabbit hole in terms of shorebirds, um, but I'm going to try to avoid that tonight because uh, <laughs> we don't have that much time. But um, they really like shorelines and, and, and wetland areas and places where they can find their food readily. 
This bird in the middle uh, is one of my favorite all-time birds too. This is called a Northern Harrier. Um, they are like a cross between a owl and a hawk. And they they're, used to be known as the marsh hawk. So they hunt over um, low-lying vegetation through marshes and grassland fields. And you will see them coursing over uh, coursing over these certain areas. They don't hunt in the woods like say like the Cooper's hawk will or, or a goshawk or um, they like these open areas where they can slowly fly around. And um, they're, what's so cool about them is that their, their face is kind of designed like an owl. So they're, they're a harrier that's like totally separate from hawks and owls and stuff, but their face is kind of like an owl where it captures sound so they're very good at like hearing mice scurrying around or squeaking as they fly over. And then they'll sit there and they'll hover and they'll just go psh, dive in and grab a, a mouse or whatever. Um, but they really like those open areas and we can find those around here um, in, in the winter too. That it's a great time to see harriers flying around. Um, I chose this bird up here in this corner. This is a prairie warbler. Um, it's kind of a misnomer. Um, they don't breed in the prairie. <laughs> they breed in uh, shrubby second, you know, second growth areas, old farm fields. Um, there's a handful of preserves that that the land trust owns, such as Lindsay Parsons, the Park Preserve, and Logan Hill have really well known, established nesting uh, prairie warblers. There, they have a very distinct uh, call that sounds like a um, a bird, or I'm sorry, a UFO taking off. <laughs> it's the best way I can describe it. But um, they have these really distinct habitat requirements where they, they like to breed. And what's cool is that this is also kind of the northern edge of their breeding territory. So they tend to be more southern species, but they we do find them up here. In fact, you can find them all the way up on the east end of Lake Ontario at on a couple of um, areas up that way too but there is south of Ithaca there's some really great um, habitat for these birds um, but they have a very they like shrubby uh, old fields so um, and then down the bottom uh, which is one of the most beautiful birds we have around here and that's a scarlet tanager uh, they they like mature deciduous woods so you know, again, I'm not going to say you won't see this tanager, you know, on the edge of this field where the bobolink is, but they really want those deciduous woods for nesting purposes. All right, range. So this is uh, this is a very unique uh, example I'm using here, but um, again, your field guide should have a really good range map. Uh, what I again, what I like about Sibley's, and no, I'm not getting a commission from this talk um, from David Allen Sibley, but um, what I like about the guide is that he has a range map on each page for each bird, whereas, uh, say, Peterson's will have them listed in the back separately because I just like everything on one page. Uh, but again, that's up to you uh, to determine. But, anyways, um, so I wanted to sh talk about range a little bit here because. I have this example of this range map over here. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but you can see there's three distinct colors and the light blue is the non-breeding. So it's all shoreline. So I'm assuming it's some sort of goose or duck or whatever. Um, I don't know. <laughs> and then the bright yellow is where they're seen when they're migrating. Um, so that's throughout the United States. It's not an Eastern or Western species. It's something that occurs everywhere. And then they breed up in the north and up towards the tundra and in the uh, northern climes of Canada. Um, so that's a very distinct map, but I think it's a good example to show you, um, you know, how you can use those to determine what, um, what you may be seeing. Um, so this little um, collection over here is uh, two of the different chickadees that are found in the eastern United States. Um, the mat, so the one on the on the left here, this is a uh, black cap chickadee, which we have uh, many of those in our area. Very uncommon bird, I'm sorry, very common bird uh, that, that stays year round. Um, I get them at my feeders daily. Um, they're really cool birds, fun to watch, uh, watch them forage and hang upside down. But they have two very close relatives and the one I chose is the Carolina chickadee here. 
So side by side, it's really not that hard. To, I mean, it's hard to tell the difference, uh, especially as fast as these things move. Um, but, you know, once you get comfortable and start learning how to identify different things, you'll notice things like the, the black cap has a little brighter wing uh, color on their wings, whereas this is more dull. Um, the, the Carolina chickadee has more gray on the back of its head, whereas the black cap is more white. But what I use, and I think the most useful for this particular example, is the range map. Because look how distinct that is. Like this is the uh, black cat chickadee. Um, they're found year round in this area. And then down here is the Carolina chickadee. And there's some, there's slight overlap and I'm assuming like the Blue Ridge area. Um, I can't see that close, but um, you can see that the, that we don't really get Carolina chickadees up in New York where we, where we are. However, we will get boreal chickadees up way north in the Adirondacks. Um, but you can see they have a very distinct range map. So that's another good tool and thing that you can use to help, um, you know, help you decide which bird you're seeing and, and identify it. Um, so the bird songs is something that we can get into that I could try to do a whole talk on this, but I'm admittedly not a great birder by, you know, I don't know all the songs. There are folks out there that can hear two notes and tell the song right away. I'm getting better at it, but again, this takes a lot of practice. Um, bonus points to anyone that can get this reference of, about the bird song when they sing a little while and then fly on. Um, I was just, I've been working with volunteers the last few weeks and now's a really great time to be birding, and especially by ear because I'm, you know, we're, we're clearing trails and and stuff and so I do a lot of birding by ear while we're working and I always have a hard time remembering I, I know I've heard these certain bird songs the year before but then I don't you know you hear them for like maybe a couple weeks as some of them are migrating through and then you don't hear them for a year so I have a hard time you know getting them in my memory and and but um, there's tools that you can use to help you remember that um, again, this is very challenging. Uh, when I was a student at Finger Lakes Community College, I, I was living in Rochester and I would commute two to three times a week, 45 minutes each way. And I had a CD of bird songs that I would just listen to back and forth, uh, mostly because I was getting tested on them, but it takes practice in, in learning how to, to tell the difference. But there are some you know, tricks and tools that you can use um, that that can help you identify birds so um you know you'll hear a lot of birds have some very distinct patterns to their calls and they say certain phrases or mnemonics and again the the field guide usually will spell those out to you um there's a lot of great online audio uh tools you can use too which i'll talk about uh in a little bit but um you know, once you start hearing and listening to songs, each each bird has a distinct pattern. And again, that's what helps differentiate it from other species while it's trying to attract a mate to breed. Um, so some of these uh, birds that I have here, so this is, I'm a huge fan of birds that say their own name. <laughs> so this is the Easternwood Peewee. Uh, they're starting to call now. Um, they have been calling for a few weeks, but they will call in the middle of the woods and you'll hear them say the peewee or the bob white that's a very popular or, or common well not so common here but it's a bird that is known for saying its name it's called bob white <laughs> so there's some that are easy to try to remember that, that are easy to remember and others that are so distinct that you'll never forget them and i'm hoping that most of you have heard the barred owl call so this is a barred owl right here uh it's not the biggest owl that we find in our area, but it's one of the biggest. Uh, they're pretty uh, common. I've heard them singing there in the day. Then they have that very distinct phrase of who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. And so that's one that is pretty easy to remember. And when you hear it, you're like, oh, yeah, that's that barred owl. Because, you know, at times it's, you'll hear it at night and you won't see it. But um they're just a really impressive bird. And once you hear that, you'll you hopefully never forget it. <laughs> um, 
Another trick for learning bird songs is that once you start becoming familiar with them and the different species and their habitat requirements, you'll start noticing that certain birds kind of have the same needs and, and like breed or, or hang out in the same areas and you'll hear them calling in the same area. So the example I chose here are these two warblers. This is a chestnut sided warbler and this is a yellow warbler. And they both have very, you know, the songs are kind of similar. I do struggle with them at first, you know, um, and when spring rolls around, because again, I haven't heard them all for that long. So I'm trying to jog my memory there. But these two birds tend to, you know, hang out in the same area and they have somewhat similar songs. But there's other birds that hang out in the same area. And you can, you know, once you learn one song, maybe you can use it to identify another one for you. But again, this takes a lot of practice. It's very challenging. And there are other tools which you can use too. But um, I really like trying to remember this stuff <laughs> too. So uh, it's challenging. Um, so some of the resources I'd like to uh, highlight here are uh, listed. I'm sorry if that um, box is kind of muddling things up here. Um, but I'm happy to share this slideshow with you if you like or these resources. But I've got a list of things here that are um, I think are very helpful and um, online resources that will help you uh, learn how to identify birds and, and, um, and, you know, get better at it as you go along. So uh, the Cuga Bird List, I already mentioned that. That's American Birding Association. That's a local, um, you know, bit. Uh, in this area around the Cuga Lake Basin, uh, there's a great bird club here called the Cuga Bird Club, and they host outings. And, you know, you can become a member of that and go on and bird trips and go around the lake trying to identify different birds throughout the year. Uh, there's gatherings and they also have this series of talks. Um, so it's, it's a really great um, if you go to the Cuga Bird Club website, um, you could probably sign up to become a member and and um, you can see a list of some of their hikes. Because again, one of the best ways to learn how to identify birds is go with other birders. Um, there's a, a very active community um, throughout the country probably, and, and there's some great groups and people are always looking to share and help others. Uh, and just, you know, usually very kind people that I've come across doing this. Um, Rochester Birding Association, up if you're up in the Rochester area, that's a good one to go to. Again, they, they host hikes and, and, and bird outings. Uh, Shemung Valley Audubon out of the Southern Tier. Uh, they have, I believe they actually have some land where they have nature preserves uh, where you can go birding, but they also host hikes. And sometimes we're lucky to get folks from these um, these groups hosting hikes for us. And hopefully next year we'll be back to doing that. And if you're up in the Syracuse area, the Onondaga chapter of the Audubon Society um, has a, is, a, is a very active group. And what's great about that is they're, um, they manage the Derby Hill Observatory, which is in the town of Mexico on like the southeastern end of, of um, Lake Ontario. And it's a great hawk watching site. Um, Braddock Bay, if you're up in Rochester, this, this organization is pretty uh, dear to me because um, I grew up, um, you know, fishing along the um, shoreline in, in Lake Ontario and the, there's a number of ponds and, and stuff up that way. And I'll never forget seeing, being out there fishing during a mass migration event of raptors and there were just hundreds and hundreds of hawks and, and eagles and turkey vultures just soaring above our heads and just moving, migrating north to go to their breeding grounds. And Braddock Bay Raptor Research um, is a great organization based out of that area um, that hosts, you know, educational events. Uh, when I was at Finger Lakes Community College, I did lead a hike for them. Uh, they have a banding station. Um, and I don't know if they still do it, but you used to be able to take tours of the banding station. And if you're lucky, they would, they would capture a bird of prey and put a band on it and check its measurements and you get really up close. And that is just even more awe-inspiring to be that close to like a big red tail hawk or, um, you know, uh, owl even. Um, but they have a great event, um, annual event where they have, there's hawk watchers and they, they sit on a platform and they count hawks and, and eagles and birds flying over. 
and you can go visit them and they'll teach you ways to identify different birds by their silhouettes and how they and how they soar through the sky. Um, so there's definitely some great resources and groups out there that are willing to educate you and, and provide you with the information to hopefully improve your birding skills too. Uh, eBird is another great uh, resource because people can put in their sightings there and the location and the species that they're seeing. So you can go to that website and click on, you can zoom in on a map and click a, a pin or whatever, and, and it'll take you to this site. And uh, some of our nature preserves are actual eBird e hotspots on there, like the park preserve. Um, gets a lot of people out there birding. And so you can click on that site and it'll show you the birds that you can probably find out there. And then you can go try to see them yourself and, and then know, you know, what you're looking for and, and hope to find it. Uh, one of my favorite re online resources is all about birds. Um, it's just got such a great layout. It talks about habitat requirements, nesting. Uh, what I used it a lot for is there's a great bird call collection for each species. So they'll do their song, their calls, and variations of it. And there's usually a couple different versions of the bird calling. And so I use that to help, you know, confirm something that I saw or heard. And um, it's just a really great resource um, that's, that's there for you on, on the web. And then through that, you can access the Merlin ID app. Um, I have never used that because, again, I'm old school. I like the uh, field guide. Um, but that ID app can help you um, answer. It asks you a bunch of questions, and that helps to, um, you know, help you identify the bird through different, you know, color, weight, size, you know. Um, so that can be very helpful. Um, I know a lot of people, um, you know, can learn through that method more than using a book too. So, you know, do what is best for you. Um, lastly, I'd like to do a plug for the, the Land Trust. Um, recently, we hosted a um, um, another Zoom by uh, Mark Chow, who is one of the most incredible birders in this area. Um, he hosted a, a how-to session on how to use iNaturalist which is an online resource where you can report all sorts of things that you find, plants, uh, mushrooms, bugs, stuff like that. And so in the month of June, which starts today, <laughs> um, the Land Trust is hosting this bio blitz on our nature preserves. And we're encouraging people to go out with iNaturalist and try to identify as many things as they can in our nature preserves because we like to have that information and we can update that and we can track things and see, you know, if there's a rare plant here, um, you know, and uh, so there's a recording that you could go to through our website um, to um, watch that how-to video. And then throughout June, you can go to one of our nature preserves and input uh, some species data for them. Um, so we're getting close to the end of the time here. Um, I think I've been talking enough. <laughs> So I'd like to, um, you know, open it up and see if anyone has any questions on anything. All right. There is, uh, going back earlier to um, the first question, I think I've addressed this already, but someone is just wondering what power binoculars you use. Uh, mine are seven power. Uh, these right here, uh, they're kind of compact. Um, they're very solid. I've definitely dropped them. <laughs> um, I've used them in cold, rain, snow. Um, and uh, these I've had these for 20 years. And again, what I like about the seven power is that um, they are lighter and you get a better field of view. And so with the birds, they tend to, you know, of course, especially like warblers, they tend to dart around and move very quickly. I and mean, if you have a little wider view, you'll be able to hopefully hone in on these birds uh, a little quicker. Okay. Um, can you explain what wing bars are? Uh, yeah. So wing bars are, uh, they're a pattern of the bird's feathers. Um, and they show up as uh, different, you know, uh, some birds don't have them, other birds do. So a, a good example, I would say, is like a red-winged blackbird. Those red stripes on their 
Um, wings, those are also called epulets, but um, they're also a wing bar. But sparrows and, and like that blue wing warbler I show is actual a pattern, a color, it's coloration of their feathers on their wings that are that form like a straight line or a bar. Okay. Um, what birds are here year round as opposed to migrating birds? <clears throat> well, yeah, there's a lot of uh, great birds that um, stick around. Uh, some of the most common we'll see um, are black cap chickadees, um, some of the sparrows, uh, tufted titmouse, the woodpeckers. Uh, woodpeckers do not really migrate. I mean, they might migrate a little locally to a food source, but um, you can see uh, most species of woodpeckers throughout the year, um, like downy and, and harries and pileated. Um, I get all those at my bird feeder year round. Um, and uh, actually goldfinches will stick around year round. They just, they have a very dramatic uh, plumage change. Um, and they just like in the winter, they'll just look like a little, a little brown bird, but um, they, they tend to stick around, which is why I put out Niger seed and, and, and you know, feed for them because they, uh, they might, um, you know, need it more than others. So, uh, but yeah, there's a number of birds. Uh, some of the sparrows will stick around and then we'll get, certain species of birds that we'll only see in the winter, like the snow bunting, uh, common red poles. Um, they don't breed around here, but they'll fly down here to food, uh, to find a food source, and then they'll fly back north for the breeding season. So they're probably mostly gone now, but like a snowy owl is another good example of that when we get snowy owls around here. But uh, yeah, there's a good number of birds that stick around. Um, I've been seeing uh, I've had uh, bluebirds around our house year round. Um, uh, Carolina wrens, I uh, hear them calling year round too. So yeah, there's there's a bunch out there and you'll, you'll hear them too. Um, okay, what, um, oh yeah, is there a best time of day to go birding? <clears throat> uh, morning's usually best. Um, there's uh, definitely, you'll hear that, you know, I think, before, especially during hot weather, uh, early morning is the best. Um, they just tend to be more active. They're feeding uh, for the day, starting to feed for the day and move around and sing. Uh, during really hot weather, you'll hear, uh, or you won't hear many birds singing. There are some that will continue being active, but they tend to hunker down, you know, kind of like me sometimes during hot weather, I'm more active in the morning. Um, but, uh, yeah, morning's the best time. And even, you know, you might hear some more songs at dusk. Um, like I've, I've been hearing a, a cat bird singing quite a bit right around right around now, actually, in our yard. Um, but yeah, morning, I would say morning before 9, 10 o'clock um, is when birds tend to be more most active. Um, what is the most interesting or rarest bird you've ever spotted? Oh my gosh. Um, well, the most, so I have an answer for each of those. Um, the most interesting bird I ever spotted when is when I lived out West in Colorado. Um, I was, uh, in a, I was up in Fort Collins and we went for this hike, me and some friends, and we were on this creek in, called Poudre Canyon um, outside of Fort Collins. And we were sitting, we crossed the stream and we're sitting on these rocks in the middle of the stream. And I saw this little gray bird pop up out of the side and then like dive into the water and pop up on the other side. And it was just the coolest like thing. I'm like, what is that? And then I looked it up and it was a, a, a oozle or American dipper. Um, so there's this cool little gray bird that can walk underwater in this flowing mountainous stream. Uh, which kind of blew my mind a little bit. And then um, uh, one of the most rarest birds, I when I was in Newfoundland, uh, we saw a, um, was a little egret, which I think was a, is a um, got, it came, it got blown in on a storm, I'm assuming from like, um, from Africa, I think. Um, I'd have to look it up. Uh, I don't want to kill too much time, but it's in the book here. <laughs> I made a note of it. 
Um, but that was really cool. And just the pelagic birds, like being out on the ocean and seeing uh, petrels and sheer waters and, and some of the birds that spend most of their time out at sea. And puffins, ah, oh, puffins, so cool, especially breeding colonies. They're like flying footballs. They're so cool. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, Aaron Ziegler has a hand raised, but uh, Aaron, if you could type your question into the chat window next to Jason. Um, otherwise, maybe unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, okay, next is... I was driving in Montezuma and saw very large nests on top of poles along the railroad tracks. What type of bird was likely nesting there? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Montezuma um, has a well-established, uh, like some nesting, <coughs> excuse me, um, it was probably ospreys or it could be eagles too. Um, I, I don't, I'm trying to think near the railroad tracks, but I would probably hazard a guess and say it was ospreys. They tend to, you're starting to see more of the platforms put up around the Cuga Lake Basin, especially if you go up Route 89 or up Route 90 along the lake, you'll see these poles with these big wooden platforms on it. And those are for osprey and they'll create these giant stick nests, but bald eagles will do that as well. Um, but I tend to find them more in snags or actually on top of power lines. Um, yeah, osprey. So it's either one of the two, um, but they are, they're massive and they're impressive. Um, and there are uh, lots of them throughout the area. And especially if you're in, um, in, in the Ithaca area down at Cass Park, I believe there's one or two active osprey nests down there on those platforms. And um, there's a whole website devoted to them as well. Um, the name is escaping me, but if you typed in Hugo Lake Ospreys, you would probably get to the, to the website that, that maps out the location of these platforms. Uh, and they're really cool birds too. They're, uh, we're called the fish hawk, but they are a raptor and, and they will dive face and head or head and feet first to grab fish out of the water. So if you've ever been lucky to see that, um, that's pretty cool. And they're big. All right, lots of questions still. Um, what's a common mistake beginners make that they should avoid? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't make it a bird. Don't identify a bird because you want to see that bird. I've done that in the past. I hope that makes sense. But like I go looking for a certain bird and I see something very similar and I'll be like, oh, that's it. I'm going to mark it off my list, but then I'll go back and I'll look at, you know, the guy closer or hear the song and I'll be like, no, that wasn't it. <laughs> um, so just, I, I always, yeah, I try to tell myself just to, you know, identify what you see, don't identify what you want it to be. Um, so hopefully that helps. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. uh, it may, that might be it. Oh, um, so someone is wondering, they're having trouble finding a birding group in their city. Um, okay. Do you know how to find birding groups other than just a Google search? Um, is there, what did, can this person share which city they're, they're in or near to? Um, because there are, you know, those who know me know that I'm not a social media person. <laughs> so I'm sure there's Facebook and, and Instagrams, but, um, if you could, uh, just say where you're from, maybe I, I, I know off the top of my head, but, um, so this person in particular is from Montreal. <laughs> oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Canada. I love Canada. Um, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess um, if there's like a, a nature center or something nearby or um, 
a nearby provincial park. Um, Canada's got a great series of natural areas and provincial parks. Um, I would inquire there if, if you can go to like the, the help center. I unfortunately don't know any places, but uh, I want to go there really bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, does anybody have any additional questions? That might be it. All right. All right. Very cool. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Yes, uh, thank you. We'll definitely try to post both the recording and the PowerPoint on our website within the next day or two. So. Will, thanks for joining us. Thank you.